All right, everybody. Let's get this one final last party started. Welcome students to Classics 160 V2, Classical Mythology, and today's last lecture of the semester, lecture 16.1, your final exam review. Let's go ahead and see what we got on the docket today. All right, announcements. Uh, I'm sure you guys can guess what most of those announcements will be, but I'm gonna do them anyway because I can. Uh, we've got three final student projects to go through today. Uh, so Emma, Valeria, and Rana, get ready. You guys are gonna be up next. Um, and then we are gonna continue through uh, with the final exam review. Again, the way that that's gonna work, it's mainly gonna be a Q and A. We'll kind of go through module by module. Any questions you have, I'll help out to the best of my ability. And we'll talk about the format just to make sure everybody's on the same page. All right, announcements, what do we have? Uh, go ahead and put your screen into speaker view. You guys know that is uh, already. Let me go ahead and make Colin a co-host as well. This is something like, you know, having worked with Zoom now, like every three times a week, at least for like the past 16 weeks, it is still a mystery to me who shows up as host and co-host. And like, <laughs> I really, I, I've made all the TAs hosts many times and like 90% of the time it works and like 10% it doesn't. Um, I, nobody knows. <laughs> These are the mysteries of Zoom. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, will this be recorded so we can go back and look at everything? Yes, absolutely it will. Uh, I'm recording um, through Zoom this time, so the quality is going to be like a little bit less uh, than it normally kind of is in HD, but uh, you'll be able to see everything and you'll be able to see the student presentations as well. Um, and that means students, right, if you are presenting and you want to go show your family over break, like look at this awesome presentation I gave to 400 people in my mythology class, you can absolutely do that. Um, and go watch some of like the greatest hits of the lectures with your family uh, over break. Um, okay, uh, what else do we have? Yeah, uh, if you have questions, go ahead. Well, during the, the um, review, you can actually send me questions. Otherwise, uh, send your TAs questions and they'll, they'll pass them on or answer them. Um, here is where we are with our game plan, right? So uh, what did we have? Last week, we did mythology and sports, kind of a thematic take on things. Um, this, uh, or last Wednesday, we did mythology in the modern world, and we saw how all the like car companies named after mythology ended up failing terribly. Um, and Friday, we had some amazing student presentations. Uh, what we're going to do today, a few more presentations, and then review. Um, when it comes to the exam on Friday, make sure to not show up to Zoom, because I will not be here. Um, and just go ahead and go to D2L, and that's where you're going to do the exam. All right, uh, student course surveys, you've got two days less to do, left, less to do them? Two days left to do them. If you don't mind taking a few minutes, uh, it's super awesome for me. In basically February, I have to sit down with my department head, who's like my boss. And then she tells me all the ways I stink and how I'm a lousy professor. And I want to be like, no, no, there's one class where people like me. And hopefully that's this class. Um, but no, for real though, it, it really is very useful in terms of kind of especially with this new format, figuring out what works really well, what does not work really well, and then I can go ahead and take that feedback and adjust uh, moving forward. And that may be particularly useful uh, if this kind of general format has ended up working really well, where like you can do it remotely, the lectures are recorded, so you can kind of go back and watch them when you want, but you still get like a little bit of like a real person talking to you rather than like, the disembodied voice of like the recorded presentation, you know? Um, if that's useful, I, I'm doing this same format again in the spring uh, with a class on the history kind of side of things. So if like what you really enjoyed like, is like, you're like, this mythology is so boring, but there's like two times we kind of talked about history with Rome or whatever, that was pretty cool. If that's your, um, your reaction to this whole thing, T take the class in spring. I would love to work with you guys again. The format's gonna be basically exactly the same uh, where, well, except Fridays. We're, we're like, the, for, the, uh, for the spring, it's only a two time a week class. So we'll do Monday and Wednesdays. Um, and then Fridays, instead of like kind of getting together, what we'll do is you guys are gonna go out on your own and do some work or, I honestly, I don't know what you're gonna do on Fridays yet. All right, you got me. I haven't planned it out. I'll plan it out over break. I'll have you do something. But if you like the history and you like this format, sign up for the class um, in uh, spring. It's called Meet the Ancients. And it's basically kind of a, 
um, a big picture history of ancient Greece and Rome. Okay, uh, late work, right? If you've happened to just accidentally miss one of your homework assignments throughout the course, have no fear, you can still get some credit for it. Get all of those things in uh, by Wednesday night, all right? And then uh, what that will mean for you guys is after Wednesday, you will have your projects done, you will have your final exam done, you will have your late work done, you guys will be totally done with this course and then you can focus on uh, all your crappy courses <laughs> and getting ready for final exams the following week. Um, study guide, right? The study guide's up on D2L. You can uh, look, it's just kind of a list of names and people and myths and stuff like that. Uh, so it's really not a lot of information. It's more kind of a jumping off point for you to kind of take notes on each one of those. Um, if you're looking for the essay questions, well, are the essay questions under today's D2L? Do I need to do that? Yeah, no, I don't know. Hey, essay questions at least are up under last week's. I don't forget if I put them under this week as well. Uh, a couple of questions real quick. Um, do we take the exam during normal class time? Yes, absolutely you do. It opens at 11, so be ready to take it then. Um, <laughs> can mysteries of Zoom be on the final? <laughs> I don't think so, but I'll see what I can do. <laughs> um, what else? Will attendance quizzes uh, for the asynchronous classes be fixed later on? Um, uh, for the asynchronous classes, um, there are no like attendance quizzes. So you just do those whenever you want, um, but there's no like attendance type thing. Um, okay, questions are under the exam day page. So you can always go to exam day. Um, uh, if some of the stuff on the questions looks unfamiliar, um, you know, feel free to look into it a little bit, um, make judgments accordingly. Let's see. Uh, anything from Jason on the Argonauts going to be on the final? Jason and the Argonauts is totally fair game for the final. So like, if you haven't watched it, watch it. It's not like I'm going to ask you what happened in minute 43. Uh, but like some very big, you know, if they spend a big, part of the movie doing something and I'm like, what did they do for the second half of the movie? Uh, you guys should be able to like operate on that sort of level. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> let's see, what else? Uh, honors projects, oh, people are sending lots of questions about the Star Wars question. Um, let me just say that if, if we haven't, that, okay, how do I wanna phrase this? One of the things that we want to be able to get you guys to do is to think outside the box, right? To be able to take the knowledge that you've learned in this course and compare it to different scenarios. That being said, uh, I don't think it'd be super fair to test you on a specific thing that we haven't like covered in the class, right? Um, so that take that for what it's worth. Um, is there going to be another essay for the final? And is there going to be a prompt list like last time? Yes, there is um, an essay on the final. The prompts are available. Go to the uh, the class, um, the day of the exam. Go to Wednesday's date on D2L under content, and you can download the list of possible questions. Uh, honors projects, if you got those, um, get them done by Sunday. Drop it in the box on D2L. I'll check those out. Um, and again, the way that those work is they don't impact your grade. So if you're like freaking out because of other classes or whatever, and you're like, there's no way this can possibly get done. My sense of it is it doesn't affect your grade at all. If you do it, you get credit for it and you get your honors credit. If you don't do it, the only thing that happens is you don't get the honors credit. You still get your normal grade in the class. Okay, so what I would like to do is I wanna go ahead and go on. I'm gonna make Emma the co-host right now. So Emma, there you go. You are now officially a co-host. Um, the stage is yours. Please go ahead, introduce yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your project and your project format, and then maybe share a little snippet with us. Um, the stage is yours. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Emma. I'm a pre-nursing major, and I've been really interested in the labor and delivery specialty in particular. So I did my project on childbirth in ancient Greece. And I made five short, like, draw my lifestyle videos because I know that this topic can be a little 
iffy for some people. They're not really comfortable with it. And it's an easy way to like give a visual without it being graphic. But please keep in mind, I'm not an artist when you see this. <laughs> so I have, can you see my screen? Okay, I have um, part four here, which is childbirth and postpartum rituals. It's only three minutes long. It's my personal favorite. So um, yeah. Hello and welcome to Childbirth in Ancient Greece, part four, Childbirth and Postpartum Rituals. According to Childbirth Motives and Rituals in Ancient Greece by Susan Wise, childbirth rituals were believed to help relieve the fear and pain of the mother, protect the mom and baby from physical and paranormal threats, and to help quicken delivery. Some practices are still in use today, such as massage and special ointments, and others are a little more unique. These practices focused on opening and closing the womb for which keys were used as a symbol. The laboring mother would undo all knots on her body, removing her clothes and letting down her hair. Amulets were again used, but these were likely different ones than in pregnancy and Jasper was placed on the mother's thigh. These amulets were mainly a psychological tool to soothe the mother, especially in a difficult labor. After birth, rituals were mainly used to purify mom and baby from the pollution of birth and help them enter into society. The baby was immediately given a ritual bath to clean them, but mainly as a way for the mother to accept and bond with the child. Much like pretty much everyone in 2020, new moms in ancient Greece were quarantined after birth. However, this was not due to a pandemic, but the belief that childbirth was a dirty event. This quarantine lasted one week to 10 days after birth, where mom and baby were strictly kept inside. This was followed by a period of 30 to 40 days of less strict isolation to contain what items and people the new mom polluted. During these periods of time, the new mother couldn't cook or prepare food because she was still considered impure. This quarantine protected mom and baby from evil, helped them to transition into a new role and a new way of life, and also protected them from the diseases and germs of the outside world. The ancient Greeks didn't realize it, but this was the most useful role of the quarantine as both mom and baby had weakened immune systems and they both needed time to adjust and heal. When the quarantine was finally over, it was time for purification rituals to be performed. It was likely that a dog was sacrificed to Hecate to help purify the house. Five to seven days, or maybe even as long as two weeks after birth, the Amphodromia ritual to Hesia was performed. As stated in class during this ritual, the baby's father holds the baby runs around the hearth three times and places the child on the ground next to the hearth. This was a symbolic acceptance of the child into the family and the father running around the hearth was meant to bind the family together. According to Susan Wise, the door was often decorated with wreaths to announce the birth of the baby. The Amphidromia also purified the baby, mom, women who had helped at the birth and those that had attended the birth. Children from poorer families were also named during this ritual. Richer families had a separate naming ceremony and sometimes a feast to introduce them to the community. After the complete 40 days of quarantine, the new mother would offer a dedication to the fertility god who had assisted with the birth and this would mark the integration of mom and baby into society. On their 40th day of life, babies may also have been introduced to the gods in some sort of ceremony. As we can see, rituals were of great importance to society, and the postpartum period was an especially long time full of rituals essential to the entry of the baby and the re-entry of the mother into society. Hello, that looks fantastic. Really well done. Very, very well done. And so you, did you do it with a couple different rituals? Is that kind of the idea there? Um, yeah, I like split it up into like different subtopics instead of making like a really long video. So like the, I have like pregnancy and fertility rituals and then like childbirth and postpartum rituals and like the goddess of childbirth and like a famous childbirth story. So, yeah. Well, it looks wonderful. Excellent, excellent job. I love it. Uh, all right. Next up, we have got Valeria. Valeria, I'm making you a co-host right now. There you go. Um, all right, Valeria, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your project. Share us, uh, share a little snippet with us. The stage is yours. Hi, everyone. So um, my name is Valeria Tapia. I am a sophomore here at the UVA. I'm an uh, information science major and music minor. 
And I decided to do for my file project a website on uh, Medusa as well. And uh, how she, how her ancient depictions have led her to be, you know, very famous in modern society. So um, I'm going to share my screen with you so I can sh show you my website I made. Okay, so this is what I made. Um, I got creative with the buttons and stuff so you can like cover over it and there's many like sub pages. Um, I here I put, this is a homepage. So I put like a general overview of that introduces her and uh, my topic. And um, yeah, so I said this website, I'll be researching my, I will be showing my research on how Medusa is depicted in modern ancient society and how such depictions had led her to be a popular Greek mythology character in the entertainment world. And um, I said that I felt that this was interesting because if you notice, she's in many movies, toy lines, videos, animation companies. And she has also been one of the chosen few um, Greek mythology characters to symbolize monsters in um, ancient mythology world. And I can, um, and then I put right here, this was created by me. And then I also put like a sub link there that leads to my about me page. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like a little bio about me. And then I say, I create this website for a file project of Classics 162, Classical Mythology taught by Professor Dr. Robert Stephan at the University of Arizona. So, um, and I wrote more, more about <laughs> myself here. And then I put my social media links and these social media links are for the wix.com, but these are mine though. <laughs> so then um, that's my about author page. Then I go to the history page and we have a little history of Medusa as well. And um, I, yeah, so I said, this is a mortal one of the three Gorgon sisters. The story of Medusa from Greek mythology has several versions. One of the most famous versions of Medusa's myth is told by the Roman poet Ovid, where it states that Medusa was originally a very beautiful woman. And one day the Greek mythology god of C, Poseidon, raped her inside Greek goddess Athena's temple. And I put Athena as the goddess of wisdom and warfare. And from there, Athena cursed Medusa and her punishment for such disrespect was to make her a hideous snake monster with snakes on her head with one look at Medusa's gaze would turn anybody into stone. And I, uh, I also cited in Ovid's Metamorphosis book four, he tells the myth of Medusa highlighting how Medusa's head still maintains its power without attached to her body after the warrior Perseus cut off her head. And this could symbolize the power of Medusa after death, which I feel has led her to be a popular in modern society. And then I put more information about the Greek myth can be found here. And then this is a website that basically just leads you to the whole myth of Perseus and Medusa in a short way. So it's perfect. I felt it was perfect for the common, um, for anybody, you know, general visitor that could just read something short and not get overwhelmed. <laughs> um, so then I, I also cited my images. So that's the history page. And then I go to the modern society page and I put how she is symbolized in modern society. And the, what she was mostly symbolized is a woman's power and her gender role. Um, that was mostly the big uh, theme that everybody kept uh, symbolizing her as. So I included one of the articles that I thought was interesting and I put a quote from the author here and then I cited it as well. But it basically talks about how she is symbolized and how her beauty and horror have made her very, you know, popular today and has attracted many people. And then there's more pages here. I put Medusa's on toys as well. <laughs> so I put several toys she is included in, uh, they made a Barbie Medusa as well. Um, you click on this, it shows her there. Um, go there. Same here. So she was, yeah, to the, this collection, there was actually three Barbies they made. There was Athena, Aphrodite, and Medusa. So this is what I mean by she was a chosen few. Um, it's a very rare collectible. There's only 6,500 of this doll made. So that's pictures I put of her and that's her box. Then there's this one from safari.org. 
Com, just a website that makes toys. And then there's different depictions of how she's made. There's even a marble one um, that was for Walgreens. And uh, you can zoom on it. And then there's a uh, Monster High from Mattel. That's, this, is actually, this is actually a son of Medusa, Deuce Corrigan. <laughs> uh, this is like a parody. Uh, there's a live doll. You actually press on it. He has a gaze and it makes a noise. Um, yeah, so I put subtopics. And uh, this is probably one of the most famous one. And then how he looks like. That's why I put more attention to this one because he's the most famous one <laughs> in terms of the toy world. <laughs> um, yeah, Monster High was such a big thing. I remember I was a huge fan myself. Um, so then there's also Oriental Training Company's Halloween Medusa toy decoration for Halloween. So she makes noise and stuff. <laughs> and I put her in movies. How she's depicted in movies where she's been featured in. So this is Percy Jackson, the Olympians, Lighting Thief. How she's pictured there. And then I put a director who is starring in this in all the movies. And this is Clash of the Titans, <laughs> that's the new one. And uh, I put subtopic again, <laughs> 1981. And this one, I feel this one's the most original or accurate depiction of her. <laughs> Uh, in terms of what the Greek mythology people have described her as. And then there we have her in Hercules in an animated series in 1999. And we have her in ancient art, how, how the ancient world depicted her. So this is one of my sources. She's in the ter terracotta jar where Perseus beheading the sleeping Medusa. And then there's this one. It's like a stone, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> You could zoom on it and there's the sites. Then I put my references. And this image site is one. This one is the background, this background image. <laughs> and that's that's me. And then about author again, there's me again. <laughs> and that's my website. Great. This is like a like a one-stop shop for everything Medusa here. Uh let me ask you, what's What's something surprising you learned when putting all this stuff together about Medusa? What's like something you didn't either know going into it or expect going into it um, that you learned along the way? Yeah, well, I didn't think that making a website was going to be a, a lot of time into it. You know, it was a very... Did it take uh, a ton of work to get it all formatted? Uh, yeah, you know, I didn't have to code it because Wix.com makes it easier, but it... What I, what I wanted to get my point out that made it, I know, more time consuming, but it was fun overall. You know, I, I, I was having trouble deciding what colors makes the background and this. I think that took more time. <laughs> and I didn't think that was going to take time, but the importance of having a background image and color and everything blend together was what I realized was, you know. Oh, wonderful. It looks <laughs> really, really good. Uh, next up and last, Thank but you. certainly not least, uh, we've got Rana. Rana, I'm going to make you co-host right now. There you go. Uh, so if you're out there, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your project topic, your project format. Show us a little snippet. The stage is yours. Hi, guys. I'm Rana. I am doing in retailing consumer sciences I'm right now. And I love fashion. Everybody who knows me knows I'm a crazy lady. Um, so my topic, uh, here, let me try to share this screen real quick. I made a, a kind of a long video. It's kind of my fault. Um, but I'm going to go through it for the sake of time. Um, just go through certain parts and just talk about, um, what I was talking about basically in the video. So, you know, clothing has a really big importance in Greek society, especially in religion and ritual societal status to like identify them this is what like historians used to identify certain characters and people um you know from ancient greece so can you guys hear that as a mortal woman she prepared herself to make us first or should i try something else I think the sound's coming through. It's a, it's a little soft on my end, but I think it's coming yeah, through. Yeah, it's very soft. The sound in the audio is soft, which is why I'm going to explain some of the things. So basically here, I'm just uh, like giving an anecdote to Aphrodite and Kaisis, 
um, the mention of it is like she was decked out in gold and then he was like, well, damn. And then built her an altar. Um, <laughs> and um, I was just introducing the project here. And then, you know, another form of uh, clothing being important is the, um, I forgot what those are, Hermes uh, tells his uh, sandals in the Homer's Iliad. Oh, so lands with that's just one thing I was talking about and how important they are to him. And so especially since he is a messenger, kind of like USPS, which would make sense that he has that. This is just something else. And then I am talking about Medea here. Um, and then this guy, his name is Jason and the J in his name stands for jerk. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, I was just talking about how the symbolism of clothing, you know, with her robe being poisonous and killing her children, which is just terrifying, but okay. You know, I understand, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was just one mention of another form of clothing in ancient society. Miles too far. Yeah, a little bit. And then I talk about ritual here. So this is really, I find this one of the most interesting things that I found in the research I'm doing so I've done so far. So basically this is let me see what this is called. I totally that forgot. The so sorry. Of Arcadia where girls reach a time where they become Parthenos, like Athena. In this festival, the girls are dressed in an ex Yeah, so basically I was talking about this ritual in the festival of Arcadia, where girls become Parthenos, which means they are becoming virgins. They just uh, reach the age of being like, you know, kind of like an adult when they get their period and all that stuff. And basically they get like these ropes that are dyed with saffron. And this is so interesting because they believe that the saffron ropes, you know, obviously they symbolize entering the adult life and being ready for marriage and being ready for, you know, to be a mom and all that stuff. But it also the rope, the saffron is believed to have medicinal purposes like to alleviate the pain um, during like the menstrual cycle. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then there's also, you know, this other uh, ritual they do of the 16 women where, you know, different uh, groups of women, different ages, they will go in a race and then they win this crown of, um, of olive branches. And then, let me see. Yeah, so this is how the clothes are made. You know, it's just a rectangular piece of fabric. And then you get like right here, this chin is probably good for like a cocktail party or something. Or um, I don't know, like, it's just, I thought it was really interesting that they could make so many forms of dress from these kinds of just the piece of rectangular fabric and like some pins. And then they fasten it with, this right here is called a band. It's kind of like a belt. Um, and then. Let me see. I was also talking about like the, you know, uh, another thing that I talked about was the symbolism of uh, clothing with children. So Greek society believed that, you know, Greek historians believe that children were kind of treated like adults just because of the way they dressed and also um, the way they were introduced to life. Like they would, their, you know, children were taken with their parents to festivals literally filled with wine. And um, this baby, we talked about him in class, but he terrifies me. He looks like he should pay bills and uh, he knows a little too much. Um, but yeah, the, <laughs> the moms are supposed to make a piece of cloth for the baby before uh, marriage. Um, and that's what the babies wear when they are born. Um, I'm not sure if Emma talked about this or not, but yeah, this is just something I have researched. I don't know from. what about this baby. And this is dramatic music videos. in there. And um, yeah, this is where I was talking about how the children were treated almost like adults. And then I concluded it. And then there's the credits for me because who else? And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rana, it looks wonderful. Thank you so, so much. 
Oh my God. sharing your project with the class there. So it, it really does look good. Nice work on that. I'm um, glad thank you to everyone who, uh, who presented. Um, I really appreciate uh, you sharing your work with the class. And it's great to be able to see uh, the huge variety of things that you guys are doing and working on uh, and the formats that you guys are use, utilizing. So what we're going to do now, um, before we get to the uh, exam itself, let's go ahead and make sure that we get our uh, attendance done. Uh, the color for today is very obviously named after the drink. It's orange. All right. So go ahead, take a minute, get on to D2L, put in orange for today. Uh, and aren't you glad that you stuck around uh, and got your attendance credit? Aren't you glad that it's almost thanks Thanksgiving break? No, it's almost winter break. We're almost here. All right, so go ahead, take a minute to do that, and then we're going to jump into the uh, the review. All right, let's go ahead. Uh, if you haven't put it in yet, go ahead and put in orange. But let's go ahead and get to the uh, the final exam review here. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the format first, any kind of big picture questions in terms of uh, how this is gonna operate. Now's your time to ask them the general idea here. Why don't I have like the essay on there? I should put that on there. Hold on, hold on, hold on people. All right, just calm down, hold on. There we go, one essay question. All right, there we go. Okay, so here's the format of the exam now. You've got uh, the exact same thing that you had for the midterm, all right? 25 multiple choice questions. Um, some of those are gonna be just kind of word-based questions. Some of them are gonna be like, oh, here's like a mythical person. Who is this person, right? And there should be some like identifying characteristic about that person, right? Like if somebody is holding a head of Medusa, you should probably know who that person is, right? Like that's kind of the, the type of thing there. Um, uh, other questions are just gonna be normal. The essay question itself is gonna ask you to synthesize information um, from across lectures. Uh, both halves of the course are fair game for that. Uh, the goal for that is going to be to try to construct the question again in a way um, that there isn't necessarily like a right or wrong factual answer, right? Uh, what I want you guys to be able to do is to kind of really think about the question, right? Um, come up with your own creative answer and then support it, right? So the, the way that you're going to do a good job on that question, the way that you're really going to get um, points for it is by being able to support your answer, which is going to have some level of opinion in it uh, with evidence um, from lectures, from readings, that sort of thing. You don't need to cite anything, right? I don't need like parentheses, Homer, the Iliad lines, like 34 to 62 or something like that. But if you know that like Homer was the person talking about whatever you want to talk about, that's not a bad idea to say like, oh, as we see in Homer's Iliad, blah, blah, blah. Achilles is really angry a lot of the time. Um, mentioning your source is always a good idea, but you don't have to do it in the formal like uh, parenthetical citation sort of way. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> whichever of the TAs wrote the Star Wars question, <laughs> that, one, that one's really getting a lot of traction. Um, okay, so uh, while, you know, asking a question about, you know, some sort of comparative thing is totally fair game, um, I probably won't be asking you uh, about 
one specific thing that you have to know that we didn't cover in class, okay? Um, but if you're really, really, if you do want to know about how Star Wars compares to the Roman Republic, uh, absolutely feel free to like, I don't know, read a Wikipedia article on Star Wars or something. Um, yeah, but I guess what I'm saying is don't worry too much about that exact thing. All right, so that's the big picture format. Any questions about format? Speak now or forever don't speak. All right, good, 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 awesome. Again, if you, it, one thing I would, would say, right, is if you did well on the midterm, right, put in a, uh, a similar level of effort, right? Make sure your notes are well organized and you're ready to go. Um, if you didn't do well on the midterm, adjust your efforts accordingly, all right? Speak now or forever hold your grease. <laughs> that's exactly, that's exactly right. Very good, very good. All right, exam content. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna, we got one slide for like each, um, you know, each of these kind of modules. Uh, when we're talking about heroes and Heracles, right? One of the things that we spent a fair amount of time talking about were the definition uh, of heroes in antiquity, right? What the characteristics were. Uh, you can go back and get those from lectures. Hopefully they're in your notes somewhere. Um, and we talked about how one of the big things, right, is heroes actually end up dying. That's one of the big differences between heroes and gods. Uh, and then one of the big differences between heroes in antiquity, right, in Greek and Greco-Roman antiquity and modernity is that Greek heroes tend to, like, not be great people all the time, right? So when we talked about Cleomedes, if you remember that dude, right, uh, he, was, he was a hero because of his incredible strength. But he also like ripped down a school building because he lost a boxing match and killed like a bunch of kids. So, again, the idea with Greek heroes where they are extraordinary, but they're not necessarily exemplary. Um, OK, uh, and then we talked about Heracles. Right. We talked about the labors. Um, let's see uh, the horizontal versus vertical tradition. Right. This idea uh, that some heroes um, have different ways uh, of telling the same story. Right. Um, and then other heroes have different um, kind of stories associated with them. All right. Uh, and again, as we go through this, if there's anything that you guys uh, have questions on, feel free to throw it into the chat and I'll, I'll tackle it to the best of my ability. Um, we talked about Theseus and Achilles, right? Uh, and we talked about Theseus uh, in a couple different ways, right? So he goes on this journey uh, from his birthplace to Athens. And remember along the way, he's like fighting all these like guardians of the underworld, right? And he's like just kicking butt on his way there, often defeating them in like whatever way they usually use to torture people. Uh, and then when he gets there, he finds that Athens every year has to send these boys and girls to the island of Crete, uh, where there's this hideous minotaur and he decides he's gonna go um, and well, fix that problem. So he sails off to Crete he, uh, he takes kindly to the uh, the daughter of the king, right? Ariadne is the daughter of the king. They like have the hots for each other. And she's like, oh, here, please take this little like, um, take this little ball of yarn, right? And then like uh, unwind that as you go into the, the labyrinth so that when you kill the Minotaur, you can actually find your way out. And he does. And then they run off together to the island of Naxos to live happily ever after until... Theseus is like, nah, I don't need you anymore. And then he just sails off home by himself. But then he forgets to like put up the white sails and then his dad throws himself off of a cliff into the sea. But then the sea gets named after him. So he kind of has a cool legacy. We call it the Aegean Sea because of that King Aegeus. Um, and it works out well for Ariadne too. She actually gets to marry Dionysus, which like, has to be one of the most fun of all the divine marriages because you just get to like party all the time. So there you go. Um, Achilles, right, are like centerpiece for the story uh, of the Iliad. And one of the big takeaway points there, right, remember that when we tell the story of the Iliad, yes, it very much is the story of the Trojan War, but it's also, you know, one of the, the reasons it's had such a lasting legacy is because of the depth of kind of character that you get out of this. And in particular, it focuses on the rage of Achilles, um, kind of how that developed, the impact that it has on the Greek army, 
um, and then how that's transferred after the death of Patroclus, right, into to kind of this strength in battle, um, and eventually the victory of the, the Greeks. All right, so uh, heroines, right? This was the, um, the week where we did asynchronous lectures. So again, those are all still available. You can go check those out. Um, I took Helen off of here because I thought I'd put that up there, but I didn't. Um, but when we think about heroines, right, one of the things we want to think about is that they end up uh, often being like better people than like the male heroes, right? Mostly the heroines are like renowned for being able to endure some sort of pain, and they often do so um, to make a better world out there, right? To, to improve society. Uh, and so some of the ones we looked at, right, were Clytemnestra. She has to somehow deal with her husband coming back home from like 10 years out at war. And then when he comes home, he comes home with another woman, and that ends in a very, very bloody affair um, that you can uh, read in the, uh, the Oresteia trilogy. Um, we've got some of the other heroines like Medea. We spent a fair amount of time on Medea, right? She's the daughter of King Aedes of Colchis. Uh, and it's Jason who sails out there to get the Golden Fleece. And just like Ariadne helped Theseus, right? Medea ends up helping Jason. They get the Golden Fleece. They sail off happily and like live happily ever after. Except that doesn't happen at all either, right? Like once they get back home, eventually Jason's like, Nah, I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to holler at this other chick, and then Medea's like, "That's super messed up. I followed you halfway across the known world to be with you, so I'm gonna try to poison that lady and her dad, and I'm gonna kill our children." Uh, so it's an extreme response, um, but uh, what we end up seeing here, right, is like women grappling with the kind of somewhat realities of a patriarchal society in ancient Greece. Um, Medea is a particularly interesting one, right? Some people um, actually end up seeing it, it. You can really interpret it in two ways. One is like a story of like a woman who's like oppressed and put into a terrible situation. And another is like an early version of like feminist literature where like she's actually put in this terrible situation and then takes matters into her own hands to actually enact some sort of agency. So very interesting story there. All right. Uh, when we looked at quest heroes, geez, that's a long list. I'm, but you'll probably know most of the things on that list, right? We looked at Perseus uh, and his journey to kill the Medusa, right? Um, we looked at uh, Bellerophon, right? Uh, and his journey to kill the Chimera, right? Teaming up with the winged horse Pegasus, who just happens to also come out of the head of Medusa. Um, we've got Jason and the Argonauts going to retrieve the Golden Fleece. Um, and so these other, the, the other kind of terms on here, right? These are all uh, parts to those stories, right? People that are met along the ways, villains or helpers, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, then also along the lines with Jason, we'll come back to Quest Heroes in just a second, but also along with the lines with Jason, right? Uh, the, the movie is fair game. Again, the idea here um, would be like trying to get a sense for maybe if you watched it or not. Not like if you remember like super detailed information about it, but like yeah, like watch it if you didn't watch it. It's not a bad idea and it's kind of a funny movie. Um, <laughs> I still really like this image of the guy like jumping out of a bathtub <laughs> acting like Poseidon. Um, okay, what else did we look at? Uh, quest heroines, right? The kind of idea there isn't so much that they're on quests, but rather that they parallel actual historical heroes in ancient Greece, right? We talked about the Tyrannicides, the two Greek dudes, the two Athenian dudes, who end up trying to uh, to kill the last two tyrants in Athens. And they're semi-successful, um, but they're remembered for generations to come as Greek heroes for trying to get rid of those tyrants. And female heroines are very frequently seen in the same kind of light that they're remembered because of something, um, something great they've done on behalf uh, of their group of people. Um, and so we see like Iphigenia, right? Uh, being sacrificed in order for ships to be able to sail um, east across the Aegean to Troy. All right, Roman mythology, right? One of the things we talked about were different influences on Roman mythology, right? It's not just a Greek kind of like thing with different names. You know, part of it's Greek influence, part of it's Etruscan influence, part of it is just like Latin Roman influence itself. Um, and a couple of the stories we told, right, 
were that of Romulus and Remus, the foundation of Rome, and some of Rome's early heroes, right? And so what we end up seeing there is how early history, and you'll see this again if, we, if you take the history class, early Roman history is this really interesting mix of both like kind of maybe historical type things, but also like it's very entwined um, with mythology itself. And we can see those stories um, in part in something like Virgil's Aeneid. All right, the movie, uh, mythology and sport, right? We talked uh, thematically um, that like one of the places mythology shows up a lot in uh, ancient Greek culture is the realm of sport, right? Everything from the very, very early um, kind of realm of um, Minoan and Mycenaean sports during the Bronze Age, right? Uh, we talked about definitions of sports and whether something like bull leaping actually counts or doesn't. Um, we talked about Homeric sports, right? From the Homeric epics and how things like the funeral games of Patroclus are really one of the first areas where sport becomes uh, recognizable in all its elements that we end up seeing today. And then we went through both the Olympics, right? The events involved, the kind of origin stories involved, their dedication to the god Zeus, as well as the other Panhellenic games, right? Those other sets of games, one at Delphi, one at Nemea, one at Isthmia, that are also dedicated and very closely entwined with the gods. So sports in the ancient Greek world, right? Very much uh, athletic contests, but also, also a place to share culture and also uh, something that's very intimately entwined with religion and mythology. And then we finally finished up, right? With, uh, with mythology in the modern world. We talked through geography, places like Phoenix, right? We talked through uh, marketing and companies, right? Nike and those car companies that failed and um, uh, Trident gum, things like that. Uh, we talked about it in medicine and science, things like the Oedipus complex, the Electra complex, uh, the Apollo space missions, the Nike missile projects, all very, very um, uh, closely um, referencing ancient Greek or Roman mythology. And then we talked a little bit about uh, their connection to modern literature with things like Percy Jackson or Harry Potter or Game of Thrones, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so for Wednesday, uh, study for the exam, Get your notes in order. If, you, if you're like somebody who takes notes by hand, one useful way to, to do that might be to type them out so that you can then search them if you need that. Uh, the exam is gonna happen on D2L. It goes live at 11. You've got 50 minutes to do the thing. Uh, the essay question is gonna be the last question. It's not gonna be jumbled in like the last time, right? So the essay question is the last question. Make sure you leave time to do that. Uh, my suggestion would be to split your time about evenly between the multiple choice and the essay because that's how uh, the grading breaks down. Uh, guys, it has been so wonderful to work with you uh, this semester. Um, I've just, I, we've made the most out of uh, COVID times and hopefully we've had some fun uh, learning about the ancient Greek world. Again, I'd love to see you in the history class uh, in the spring, it's gonna be a similar kind of format. So if you enjoyed that, um, check it out. Uh, other than that, like, um, you know, I, I hope to see you in another class in the future. If there's anything I can ever do for you guys in terms of letters of recommendation or advice in classes or majors or minors or study abroad or anything, um, always, always, always feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, and if you just want to, like, check in and say, you know, two years down the road, hey, Dr. Rob, I'm now a blank major and I wanted to tell you about all the cool things I'm doing. I would love to hear about it. It's super exciting for me. Um, so look, have a, uh, a wonderful couple days. Good luck on the exam. I'm going to be rooting for you guys. If you have any questions or there's anything I can ever do, always feel free to reach out. So it's been a great time. Uh, have a wonderful winter break and hopefully I will see some of you guys in the spring. All right. Bye everyone.